Welcome to this short lecture on labor supply. This is the first of three videos where we're going to apply our model of consumer choice to understanding a consumer's choice about how much to work, their supply of labor. And our goal for this first video is basically going to be understanding all the key terms, how to draw the diagrams, how to understand and interpret the diagrams when you see one drawn. And then in later videos, we'll be thinking about uh, how labor would change, how our choices represented on these diagrams would change with different wages and so on. So as our starting point, the choice here, even though we call it a choice between labor and leisure, leisure is a good. So we have leisure on the x-axis. That is a good. You want more leisure, you get more utility with that. But labor is not something you enjoy. I mean, uh, for most jobs, you wouldn't. You know, most jobs, you do it because you get paid, but you don't enjoy the work. If you enjoy the work, you know, that then, then you'd need a separate model. So the idea is you don't enjoy the labor itself. What you do is you, you work so that you can get money, and you use that money to buy this all other goods. So we're calling AOG as uh, all other goods. And that's the actual good that you're trying to get. So really, this is a trade-off between not so much labor versus leisure, but leisure versus getting money to buy all other goods. So all other goods. And now our goal is, before when we made our budget constraint, it was fairly straightforward. We get two points, one on the y-axis, uh, one on the x-axis. And to get those points, we just divided our income by the prices. If you spent all of your money on good x, you would get a point like, let's say, right here. And we could calculate that point by just dividing your income by the price of x. But leisure doesn't have an explicit price. There isn't like uh, you have $500 and leisure, you know, to, to enjoy an hour of leisure, you have to pay someone $10. You can enjoy leisure for free. It's a free country. So we're not going to be able to get our maximum amount of leisure that way. What we do is we just use kind of common sense and say, well, this is a model for one day. So the most leisure you could have is just spend the entire day on leisure and then you'd have 24 hours. And as far as our model goes, this point here is never going to change because there's never going to be more than 24 hours in a day. There's really never going to be less than 24 hours in a day. I guess you could say maybe some of your time is restricted for something that's non-leisure and non-labor, um, like sleep or something. But then you'd just change this number here from 24 to whatever the maximum amount of leisure you could have is. So that's our first point. That's the easy point. Uh, now we want to get a second point so that we can connect the dots and construct our budget constraint. Um, and that point's going to represent the maximum amount of all other goods we could buy. So in order to figure that out, we're going to need some more information. Specifically, we're going to need a wage represented by W and a price for all other goods. Because then we can calculate if we work all 24 hours and have no leisure, 24 times the wage gives us how much money we'll have, and then we can divide that by the price of all other goods to get how many all other goods we could have. So let's suppose that the wage is $10 per hour, and all other goods cost $1 per good. We're just picking some nice numbers so they're easy to, to work with. In that case, the max all other goods we could get is 24 times $10, so 24 hours times $10 per hour, gives us $240, and then $240 divided by $1 per good gives us 240 goods. So this point here is going to be 240 goods. So that's our two points on the budget constraint. It's a little different than how we normally get them, but in some ways it's easier because we know this x point here is always 24, and then we can connect the dots, and I'll try to make this as straight a line as I can. Uh, I did my best. Yeah, it looks pretty straight. And now we want to think about the slope of this budget constraint for a bit. So the slope here we can calculate, and it's negative 10. So, but instead of writing negative 10, I want to think about why it's negative 10. Typically, we'd expect this to be the price ratio, the price of x over the price of y. We have a price of all of the goods. It's $1 per good. So if this is px over py, it makes sense that PY is, is price of all of the goods. It's 1, so the denominator would be 1. But what is the price of leisure? There's no explicit price for leisure. As we said before, you don't have to pay anyone to take an hour of leisure. But there is a cost. There's an opportunity cost, and that's the wage. You have to give up $10 per hour to enjoy an hour of leisure. And you can think of that as the implicit price 
of leisure. So you can think of W as the price of leisure since it's the opportunity cost. And then we can look at this equation here. It's negative PX over PY. That's the wage over the price of all of the goods. And we have a special name for this. We call this the real wage. And our conclusion is that this slope here of the budget constraint is always going to just equal the real wage. So what you can do is, you know, s sparing yourself all the work, writing out slope equals blah, 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 like we did. You're given a wage, you're given a price of all of the goods. You can just divide them, get the real wage, and that's always going to match the slope here. The important lesson from that is as the wage gets bigger, this slope is going to get steeper. You're going to be able to buy more all the all other goods. As it gets lower, uh, the slope will decrease. You'll be able to buy fewer all other goods, um, whereas this point down here, the 24 hours of leisure, is never going to change. All right, so one last thing. Uh, I want to represent my optimal choice of labor versus leisure. Let's say that I choose to do... Uh, 16 hour of leisure per day, 16 hours of leisure. That sounds like a typical person. Nobody wants to work, you know, half the day or more. Well, I, I don't anyway. So, whoops, let's get that point back here. All right, so I'm going to choose to work 16 hours. Let's say that this is 16 hours. In order to represent that this is optimal, I'm going to draw in an indifference curve. It's going to be tangent at that point. I did my best to make it look tangent. Um, I think anyone looking at this diagram, if you drew this on a test, would give you credit as, as that's tangent enough. And now I want to think about, well, how many all other goods can I buy if I'm doing 16 hours of leisure? Well, it's hard to say, right? Like, 16 hours of leisure doesn't give me any money, so, um, you know, can I buy any all other goods? And the, the secret is, it's implied that if I'm only doing 16 hours of leisure, this distance here is 8 hours of labor. So you can see labor on the diagram, but it's indirect. You see leisure plotted on the axis. The gap between 24 and that amount of leisure is your labor. And now if I'm working eight hours and my real wage is 10 goods per hour, that means I'm going to get 80 goods. So I'll get 80 goods here. So in summary, we found that in order to plot the budget constraint, what we do is we calculate first that this bottom point here is always going to be 24. We calculate the point up here by multiplying the real wage by 24. That gives us a slope of, as we'd expect, negative PX over PY, but there's no explicit price for leisure. It's just the implicit opportunity cost is W. So that's W over P, what we call the real wage. That's our slope. And then finally, we saw that even though you don't see la labor labeled anywhere here on this diagram, it's implicit that whatever the gap is between your leisure here and your maximum amount of leisure is the time you spent on labor. So here that's eight hours. So what you'll see in the next video is we'll start thinking about what happens when our wage changes, to what happens to our budget constraint, what happens in terms of substitution effects, uh, income effects, and thus the total effect. So please continue watching.